Hi, I'm Pat, and this is my vlog. There's a lot of things to talk about since the last time I did this, so let's dive right in. As you see, I have some facial hair. Um, this is, uh, a lot of people are growing Corona beards, uh, kind of as a way to pass the time to recognize that we're all stuck in different, or at least many of us are stuck in different circumstances in many ways from what we would like, from what we signed on for, both at work and at home. A lot of personal relationships are in interesting places. While well, for those of us who live alone, uh, we're seeing people uh, a whole lot less than than we're used to. And that's, that's pretty rough. Um, Plus, we often have friends or family who are ill, who are suffering, who are jobless, uh, some of whom have died. Um, pandemics are, are rough on everybody. And this is something that I, I'm trying to remember when interacting with coworkers and people online to not to take stress uh, that I see and misbehavior that I see as seriously as I otherwise might, because None of us signed up for this, and uh, it's, it's unexpected. And so it, it makes sense to, to bend a bit more. Um, we are seeing some of the interesting uh, flaws in human reason that come out as people respond to these difficulties. There's a lot of people who think that they can argue with reality and argue their way out of uh, out of proper understandings of how the illness works, how it spreads. Um, maybe if I can just come up with a really good argument, then I don't have to wear a face mask. Uh, or we really should reopen now, and uh, no more people will die. Uh, and it's motivated reasoning, and there's there's a lot of that that happens in various parts of the human condition. Uh, various situations that we find ourselves in. Um, unfortunately, the, this is the worst time for it. But I think some of this is, it's the way that human cognition works. It, uh, it's not something that we carry around as active throughout most of our life. Um, evolutionarily, if intelligence is a trick, it's a sprint. Um, and it's a sprint that you do when you see a threat uh, coming over the hill. And you need, need you need a plan. You need to build it. You need to execute it, and then you put it down. It's not good for these kinds of long hauls that we find ourselves in uh, in in this kind of slow crisis. And so it's stressful because you could either leave leave yourself mentally active in that way, uh, which you're not really designed to do, and like it's it's not really gonna work. But trying can be rough, or or you can not do that, but deal with the very changed situation and uh, have this very likely false worry that it's going to change everything forever, that our current lousy situations, the much lower quality of our lives, is a permanent thing. And that's what you do if you stop realizing that you're in a, a temporary situation and you, uh, this is not the new norm. But uh, but these this tension makes it hard to, to handle in action, which is mostly what we want in times of stress. I don't mean coasting. I, I mean like literally sitting around at home, trying to do remote work, trying to console your friends without seeing them, trying to not have all the cultural events that you're used to, not, not even the small things, taking a walk in the park, running your feet through grass. Also, those other things, because we all in life deal with stresses and we build our responses to those stresses in very individualistic ways. And, and we paint with the, with the large variety of possibilities that we have. Um, we paint individual paintings that are our lives. And we, we don't have that now. And that's rough. And we just have to largely accept it or possibly adapt and find new habits that can carry us through until we can f find ways to start getting back to the way things were. And I think we're all eager to get back to the way things were. There's just a enormous danger in pretending that we're not still in this situation. 
And to that end, I'm very worried now at the end of May that the states are opening too early and we're not seeing a lot of compliance here in terms of masks. A lot of people are not getting social distancing. I live in New York and the times that I've been out, there's always maybe about 20% of people that just don't get it. And they unfortunately are going to be our disease vectors. Um, if more people were careful and compliant, then we maybe could have been out of this by now, or we could be much, much further along in the reopening and we wouldn't have over 100,000 people dead. Uh, I mean, it, it, that's, it's not, the, the blame doesn't all fall to the uh, individual people or the 20% of people who are like that, but a lot of it does. And we see some other societies that are much better at compliance uh, when they're asked to do something tough. And they're generally doing better in this. There's, there's always differences. Uh, there are, even within the United States, different population density has a lot to do with how many uh, people get the disease, how many people died. Um, I guess at this point, um, I got an antibody test and I tested positive. I'm pretty sure I know when I had the illness and it was the near the end of March. I got it, I believe, from a coworker not long before the office closed. And I had a few days where I was feeling really off uh, I had a fever, and it felt like somebody had be uh, beaten up the muscles in my back, and like all the way down my back. And so I, it felt like there was weird internal bruising, and I've never felt anything like that before. It was a strange sensation. It was an unpleasant set of li uh, or set of uh, set of uh, not lives uh, nights. Um, I hopped up and got and took a cold shower several times. Uh, on during the evenings and during the days, uh, it just uh, I and um, and now I know that that was probably COVID nineteen for me. Now I'm I'm I feel lucky because the person I I think I got it from, he suffered a lot more. Um, he had the typical exhaustion. Moving from one room to another in his apartment wore him out, and he spent most of his time just lying down. Uh, not really being able to focus on anything. Um, he, from what I understand, he just barely avoided needing co to go to the emergency room because he had trouble breathing at some parts. I'm glad it wasn't that bad for me. And I'm hoping that what I have is a uh, immunity that's either lasting or it at least lasts for a reasonable length of time. But I still have a family. I still have people I care about in life, and I don't want them to get it. Um, and of course, there's that abstract feeling of caring for humanity in general, and I don't want people to suffer, even people I don't know. Um, so, there also, I've been thinking a little bit recently, there, there was somebody who I was following on Twitter for a while because she had a really interesting story of breaking out of the social justice uh, camp of liberalism. And I found it a little bit unfortunate that she left liberalism entirely as an ideology and seemed to go pretty hard into right-wing uh, politics. But, um, but I still found her to be interesting. I followed her for a while. I did one of the th things I normally do, which is kind of act as a as a skeptical voice. And I think this is useful all, uh, uh, for people in general, although not everybody appreciates it. Um, for some of her more political posts, I would respond and break down what I think was uh, overreach or sloppy, things like that, and I would engage and and so on. Um, eventually, I guess I, I reached the conclusion that she was not a particularly careful thinker, and it looked like she was doing a lot of working out of anger 
And I know it's been several years since she left that uh, that uh, ideology, but she didn't seem to be calming down. And and I guess I I just I had hopes that she would just be another interesting person that I follow who is a thinker, who has useful critiques, uh, even from outside the left. Uh, we we need people from outside to criticize us just as much as we need internal criticism. But I didn't think that she was likely to offer that. It's a little bit similar to uh, Andy Ngo, who is a journalist or of sorts, where uh, I heard it, I, I first heard of him several years ago, and he's definitely a fairly right wing guy. Uh, I don't know if he sees himself that way, but at least the way that I use the terms and define things, uh, he is. Um, and he did a lot of reporting on uh, on the uh, on progressive liberal movements. And as as I've mentioned before, I'm not a, I am a liberal. I am fairly far left. But uh, my politi my political ideology is a mix of technocracy and socialism. Uh, and I don't have much in common with populists. Uh, I don't appreciate them. I don't like the culture war stuff that they do. I appreciate when they are pushing for stronger social safety nets. Uh, I, that is an area of shared interest. But... I would not want to live in the society that they build because their vision for the social rules of that society are so distant from anything that I could be comfortable with. Um, I kind of like the, the more libertine, very free speech nature of society as I understand it. Uh, and I want to keep that even as much as I'd like to have much stronger social programs. So within liberalism, I still consider that camp to be uh, one of the one of the opposing philosophies. Uh, one of the, the the word enemy gets gets a little. It has a lot of nuance to it. But they're definitely they're not a faction that I want to win. And between them and even completely middle of the road politics, I'd rather go with the middle of the road because I I so dislike the way that they want to change society pronouns uh, everywhere, um, canceling people uh, all the time, not uh, pr preferring to swear at people rather than have conversations, um, things like that. Um, so Andy Ngo, he did a lot of coverage of the kind of far out progressive activists and other, other groups that are more the anarcho-socialist uh, groups. And a lot of his criticisms as I saw them, they rang true. They, um, when I was younger, uh, maybe about 10 or 15 years ago, I hung out occasionally with anarcho-socialists. There were groups like Anti-Racist Action, which I believe is the predecessor to Antifa, where I just uh, I didn't have a long interaction with them because I kind of got to understand what they were about and decided, even if I grant that they mean well, their lack of belief in mainstream ethics uh, is uh, makes them really dangerous people, um, and uh, not I mean both both for the country. And just to be around, because if if you're friendly with them, they they throw interesting social events and uh, parties and so on. And I've I've been to a small number of parties. I'm not really a party person, um, but if they ever decide that you're the enemy, they will they'll lie, they'll cheat, they'll steal, um, because they're their ideology is very important to them and they see a lot of the restraints that keep us civilized as being things that stop them from achieving real justice and so they're they're just not friendly to a lot of these what i consider fairly neutral rules that are for the betterment of society 
And so I, I saw um, Andy Nago go to some of their protests and uh, off uh, and critique them at the protests. Um, and you never know when somebody's doing journalism, do they do deceptive editing? Because I know that the the Antifa folk wouldn't hesitate to do that. I've seen them do that. They'll lie about interactions with cops and counter protesters and things like that because their cause is that important to them. But none of these faults are unique to the left. Um, all these faults, they're general issues in human nature. If somebody really, really believes in something and they don't so strongly believe in a lot of these rules of behavior, uh, then they'll do those things. Um, and I've met several people who I found kind of scary who would do those things. Um, they'd consider it much more important to take somebody down who they thought was a bad person than, than, they, than they would about uh, being fair or truthful. And so uh, in my view, you just don't want to mess with those people because you piss them off, you're putting yourself in danger. Uh, and if you enable them too much, then a lot of these rules that, that at least I believe in, they fall by the wayside. And, and I don't think that we can afford to do that. These are the things that make us civilized. And it's scary right now to see a lot of neutral rules being tor like torn away by the current administration. But he's not the only one do it, uh, doing it. Populism, whether on the left or the right, in my view, this is what it does. It corrodes the habits of civilization uh, in people. And a lot of Latin American democracies have suffered this as well, where you have people like Bolsonaro um, or Maduro, both of them terrible leaders, uh, where they just decide, well, the gloves are off. And once they take the gloves off, uh, the society, it's very, very hard for it to ever get back into a good state because people want revenge or they want to unwind things and do it in uh, improper ways. Uh, and you stop having civil society and voting literally, it stops being about conversations and tests and becomes winning at all costs. Uh, and any, any representative government cannot survive that kind of mentality for very long. Um, so I, I guess this over time, having seen more of Andy Nago's uh, reporting, I, I came to doubt that he was actually doing journalism well because I kept on seeing him make more and more sloppy statements, um, statements where he, he appeared to be stirring up drama and saying things that just don't seem to be true in order to scare people. And I don't know, maybe he, he's this scared, or maybe it's intentional manipulation. Uh, this isn't a statement of hate, uh, hatred towards him or anything like that. It's, it's rather, I just don't trust him as a journalist uh, or as a positive actor in public discourse. Um, so in, in bearing through the coronavirus lockdown, I've been doing a little bit of, uh, a little bit of restructuring of trying to find things that interest me that don't require me to spend too much time outside. Um, been doing a little bit of retail therapy. Uh, ha ha. I, I, I always find that to be a funny term. Um, but I, I bought myself a Fitbit which is primarily nice because it gives me statistics on my life and uh, uh, heart rate, things like that. And it, it gently nags me to enter more statistics into it. And they have a nice data platform that's designed to help you improve your health. And my health is not that amazing. Uh, I'm overweight um, uh, and I don't exercise enough. My diet is not very healthy. Um, there's a lot of things that I should be doing uh, to improve my health, and I'm trying to find ways to get there um, that, uh, that I'll stick with. That, that's the challenge. Like we, we can start diets that we never finish. We can promise ourselves 
this is the last time that I'm going to buy sweets in the supermarket and you're not going to hold through to that. Um, I, I'm hoping just having more information available to me and a, a little bit of nagging will help. Um, I've been trying to figure out rules that I can stick by. Drinking a lot more water, uh, trying not to eat just before bed, uh, eating smaller portions, uh, things like that. It, it, and the Fitbit, I think, it just it provides a little bit more of that. And I'm, I'm hoping that just with enough of these little things, I'll start to get some traction uh, and uh, and I'll be able to modify my life habits. Like right now, I think I'm about a, uh, about 230 pounds uh, and I'm about six foot one, six foot two. I would like to get down to about 180 pounds again. Uh, that's a lot of work, but uh, any progress is a win. And any time I look down at my belly and uh, don't think, that, that's also a win. So uh, the more the more movement I can get on that, even if I don't reach my goals, if I get sufficient movement, then that's a plus. Um, I bought a new pen for my uh, Cintiq tablet. You can see behind uh, behind me uh, behind me there. It's a little bit weird to get used to pointing using a camera. But I have a drawing tablet that I had years ago that I, I for a while, did a webcomic with. And I enjoyed it. And I, at some point, my interest turned to other things, but I've been keen to get into that again. And I've been doing a little bit of sketching on paper. I should be doing more of it because I enjoy it. Um, but uh, I would like to... It, it's It's easier maybe to start with sketching things and then move to a tablet or just do it with the tablet to begin with and to actually achieve really good results just with uh, with pen and paper. And uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find the, the pen to my Cintiq, so I ordered a new one. I think once it gets closer to getting here, I'll face the somewhat trickier challenge of figuring out what, uh, what computer I, I want to attach it to. Right now, I don't have a suitable computer to connect to it. Um, I'm doing this at a pair of computers, a Linux workstation on one side and a Windows gaming rig on the other on a, on a standing desk here. But uh, And I don't really want to give that up because it's nice to have them side by side. Um, I might need to buy another computer, maybe give it a lot of storage because those files can be big um, to be uh, used as a tracing computer. Um, or, I mean, not tracing, but as, as a drawing computer. Um, thinking about that, uh, I've bought some art supplies, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm hoping to use them more as I get back into sketching. For me, the, the toughest part is getting human faces right. I think everybody finds that hard, um, but noses are tough. Uh, just a lot of parts of the human body we, we have a lot of very specialized brain hardware to parse faces, but as a result, we're very judgmental of drawing efforts that don't quite get there. And I mean, you don't have to draw faces accurately. You could decide to be on the other side of the unca uh, uncanny valley and just be impressionistic in some way. And a lot of comics do that. But, uh, I would at least like to try to get back to where I can draw a face as well. Part of, it, part of it is that I would like to be able to recognizably draw people that I've known in my life. And impressionistic uh, approaches never really get you that. Um, so I've been getting used to remote work. And I think the toughest part of that is keeping a schedule and uh, and not being distracted by the things, by the endless opportunity for activities that we build into our homes. Some of that is uh, having cats. There's also just not seeing people who you're working with in person and not having uh, the kind of setup that, that a good workplace can give you. 
Um, where I work now, we don't have an open office plan. Instead, we have small offices uh, for for one, two, or four people. It's it's an academic setup, and that's nice. Uh, I I miss my office. We we have a nice setup. It's very productive, um, and uh, there's a kitchen where we can go and chat with other people if we want to chat, and uh, and have little snacks and then head back. Or we can gather around white whiteboards or in conference rooms. It's a nice setup, and it's much nicer than I've seen when I worked in big tech. Here, um, I guess just in my apartment, I don't have quite as nice of a setup. I mean, just there's no people around. Uh, it's pretty small because it's a New York apartment, like a Manhattan New York apartment. You're not going to have uh, room for very much, and there's a lot of um, chores and distractions that just make it uh, hard to be anywhere near as productive. Plus, I miss people. And I think we're all kind of suffering this, like we're not getting as much done as we would like to in a day. And that's tough. Like, I, I don't like going into meetings and not being able to talk about these are the new things that I've done. Uh, I, I know that this won't be forever, but it's it's pretty rough. I'm I'm glad I still have a job, but um just this is not this is not ideal. Being in my apartment with um with my cats, it has me thinking a lot about mortality. They're both very old cats. They won't be around forever and I guess just I'm seeing their slow decline in health is not a pleasant thing. Uh, my female cat, she has a weird lump on her back, um, like in her back. Uh, my male cat, he's just having trouble getting much nutrition from eating. And so he wants to eat all the time and he gets very upset if there isn't uh, isn't food out. I've tried switching in mostly to wet food, which helps a little bit, but he's not putting on weight. And he I think he's actually still losing weight. And he's already pretty bony. I'm like behaviorally, mentally, they're still mostly there, but, uh, but they're not like middle-aged cats. They're clearly pretty old cats. And, and I worry about them. And it's not fun seeing this decline, particularly up close, but I guess I'm responsible for them in the general case. Uh, I'm, well, I, mean, I am, but uh, it's just it. I feel I. I also feel a little bit weird about being uncomfortable, being cooped in with them during what looks like a, a, a decline, at least for my male cat. Um, I. I've also. I've been thinking about about getting a house in Vermont or somewhere else nearby for the weekend when all of this is over and when I no longer have cats because you can't really move cats that way. I'm not sure I can afford it. I mean, I am a programmer in my early 40s, uh, but living in New York is, is expensive and... Uh, and I've spent a lot of time in academia and haven't really done a lot of the things that would that would put me on the higher end of the programming uh, pay scale. And those jobs, they've always been available. They still are. Like I could decide to go into finance, supporting a quants team, stuff like that, and get a much higher salary. But those places tend to be unpleasant to work at and you don't really feel like you're doing something societally positive during it. Um, but having a, uh, one of my co co-workers, um, he went to a family home in Vermont. And apparently it's doable to get a nice place uh, out there that's uh, out in the woods uh that's reasonably large uh that's pretty 
where you could have your own garden and have like proper kitchens and bathrooms and stuff like that, which you can't easily get in Manhattan. Um, just it's, it's pretty appealing. And I've been doing a little bit of browsing of real estate sites uh, up there. Maybe there's some way I could manage to make it work financially. I know it would be good for me to at least like, I, I think it would make me happy. And I haven't spent much of my life chasing happiness, but I think this is something which actually having a garden again and having having space somewhere, even if I spend most of my time in, uh, in New York in a small apartment during the week, having a different place for the weekend where I could stretch out and relax, that would be nice. I was listening to a podcast recently called Lexicon Valley. There was an episode called I Just Can't. And I, I like this podcast. I don't remember who recommended it to me, but um, it, it they cover a lot of issues and uh, topics that I, I find interesting. Um, one of the things I've been curious about, we already have features in English where we can turn a noun into a verb or a verb into a noun. And I'm wondering if at some point we'll, we'll have an, a, another kind of flexibility where we'll be able to turn, where mass nouns like sand, where you, uh, where you don't say uh, like I have one sand or two sands, you say I have some sand, um, where mass nouns are no longer to stay, this noun is a mass noun or it's not, but rather it's a type of usage of language where you might uh, might be able to treat something like fish as uh, as as a quantity like there's there's a lot of fish in this pond um, for, uh, versus uh, versus the other form uh, look at those three fishes and I know that right now those are just considered variant plurals uh, because the stat uh, we're kind of losing our mass nouns in English, or at least we're losing some of them. But maybe maybe having this kind of flexibility would be nice for, uh, because it would let us express the difference between whether we're talking about a feature composed of a lot of individual units, talking about it as a feature, or whether we're talking about specific units. I, th I think that that could be a nice, nice thing to have in English. I'm a little weirded out at the anti-judgmentalism that the host has, in that he has a lot of judgments about po uh, proper use of English, and he talks about them, but he always talks about them as something he's a little bit ashamed of. Like, I know I shouldn't think this, but I do. And I I find anti-judgmentalism to be a weird thing. Maybe I think I actually I find it kind of irritating. And so it's just, it's it's a very strange thing for me to to see somebody do it so visibly. It almost feels like he's putting on a show. Uh like he's saying it's okay but but try to diminish like it's okay to have this normal human feature, but try not to express it, or try to diminish it, or try to soften it. And I, I think that maybe the thing that bothers me about it is it is it feels intrusive, as if by listening to it, I'm being pushed into adopting his anti-judgmentalism, uh, or to give up on my on my own judgments, and I'm not willing to do that. And I I don't really appreciate the pressure that I'm feeling from that way of talking about it. And I guess in general, I, I'm i comfortable with language being a little bit prescriptive. And I, I don't mind critiquing people for not using language correctly. Um, I think in general, once you've shown mastery of it and provided that you continue to show mastery of it, you get a license to play with, with language. Uh, sometimes different forms, they'll aid in rapid comprehension of a topic. And 
I'm I'm not really the one to be bothered by use of language that's not maximally compact. I'm I'm cool with there being multiple ways to say something if those multiple ways add some nuance to how uh, how parsing is meant or, or or subtle gradations of meaning. Um, but I, I got a little bit of, of a feeling against that from listening to that particular episode. Also, uh, there's also a Radio Lab episode that I listened to recently called Fish Don't Exist. And that's that's something which I, I disagree with. Uh, I, I grant the argument that they were making in that episode that fish as a category don't have a lot of genetic relatedness to each other. And I even generally have some sympathy to the idea that genetics should be a big deal in terms of how we understand features of organisms. It's, it's the basis for my understanding of gender uh, and so on. And we hang various things off of, uh, off of genetics. But it doesn't mean that it has to be the, the root of all concepts. And so their, their observation that two things that people would call fish are actually less closely related to each other than a lot of land mammals. It just doesn't strike me as a particularly strong argument. For getting rid of the category of fish. Instead, if you wanted to keep the category of fish, then you could see it as being a certain body profile or an activity profile. Um, and that that kind of bo uh, body and activity profile based definition of fish, uh, fish it survives this critique that um, that fi uh, fish are not that genetically related. Just like like the term biped, uh, if bipedalism evolved many times independently, uh, we don't have to get rid of the term biped uh, because of that. Or, or if other if other features uh, evolved uh, several times simultaneously, you don't need to use different terms for those features. Uh, it just uh, it adds nuance, though, and it's worth understanding that fish might not have this kind of genetic closeness that we might assume. But we were calling them fish long before we had any understanding of heredity, and I suspect that we'll be calling them fish long after. Uh, most people understand that fish is not a genetic family tree based uh, definition. There's, there are also things that we can see from the outside. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of functional definitions like where does this kind of creature live and how might I catch it? that are common, presumably, to, to all fish. Anyhow, um, next thing I wanted to mention is, because this also happened since the last time I, I did one of these, is the accusations of sexual assault against Biden and the Me Too movement. And it's interesting seeing how this and the Title IX reforms that Betsy DeVos is doing, how they fit together as a topic. In general, I think the Trump administration has done very little good. There are a few things that they've done that I think have been positive, but by and large, I, I see this as being not just bad, but disastrous uh, as a presidency. But the Title IX reforms that DeVos uh, pushed through, which, which have been the wish list on a number uh, it, which have been part of the wish list of, of a lot of political philosophies, including several uh, liberals uh, like me. Um, th th uh, these changes seem positive. They uh, at least partly restore um, that partly restore due process to the uh, to the sexual assault accusation uh, process on campuses. At, because the, the the old Title IX rules, they um, uh, 
they made it really easy to. And uh, I feel suggested that colleges do railroad people who are accused of uh, um, sexual misbehavior on campus. And I, I think I don't want to go to a, uh, back to the days where accusations of sexual misconduct were just laughed off or like uh or seen uh, or mis we don't want misconduct to be seen as okay but we also shouldn't want an accusation to be treated as proof uh ideally we should require significant evidence uh significant strong evidence to uh be provided and to have a proper um, argument, some, uh, I, we probably should primarily be using our criminal justice system or at least most of its processes for this uh, so that if somebody is accused, it's not the end of their college career or the end of their uh, life. Um, I mean, the end of their life as a free person. We, d we don't want uh, an accusation to be the end of it. And so... These these changes, I think, have restored some due process, and I I'm worried about um, about Biden's uh, intent to reverse these fixes, and I find it to a degree ironic that that Biden is getting what looks to be potentially a, a false accusation. Um, it's I I don't have the information needed to judge. There are questions on credibility but maybe he maybe he did these things uh i i generally prefer to withhold judgment um until a trial finishes and so i don't assume guilty or innocent i just sit on unproven until and unless uh reliable uh investigations happen that can uh, look into these things But I had hoped that perhaps the, the process of being accused, if we assume Biden to be innocent of these charges, I was hoping that um, bearing, uh, bearing a false, uh, being falsely uh, accused would uh, lead him to be more sympathetic to the due process concerns involved. And that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, I still intend at this point to vote for Biden um, I don't look for perfection in my candidates. I don't look for 100% value alignment. Um, I will accept some bad policies. Um, I never thought Biden was an amazing candidate, but I don't think he's a bad one either. But this is something which I would like him to change because it is important to me. Um, not in a personal way, but uh, in a, this is a negative change for society to step away from due process uh, with the Title IX uh, regulations. Um, personally, do I believe Biden? Uh, do, do I believe his accuser? Uh, and uh, I, I don't really have a stance. Uh, I, I feel largely that our efforts as individuals to investigate these things ourselves Let's bring up the internet and, and read about them. We're bound to make a lot of mistakes on something that will dramatically change our perspectives on somebody. And I don't really, I think it's not a good habit to get into to do that. Now, there are times when I have not been as good on this as I could have. And there have been times when I tiptoed into, into some accusations, but I try pretty hard not to. Um, I, I lack the evidence uh, either way. I don't have the personal experiences. Nobody is taking the time to present them to me in a structured way to help me deal with my own biases. And I would like to be somebody who would be fair in a way where somebody might plausibly select me for a jury. And I think in general, this is a standard that everybody should uh, aspire to. We should all hope to be fair enough that we would be good on a jury. And uh, anybody who would have you believe one side automatically, 
I think they should be excluded from juries and considered defective in their moral reasoning. Uh, these are not virtuous stakes to have to decide I'm going to believe one side or believe the other automatically uh, or just based on some internet research. That's not a good way to reach decisions around people. You shouldn't treat an accusation as evidence, but you also shouldn't um, assume, oh, this is a good person, they would never do anything bad. Because people who seem generally pretty good, most of us have dark sides of our personality. Sometimes we struggle with them, sometimes we don't, but we're all made from the same stuff. We all have instincts that we struggled with. Uh, I, I struggle with my diet, uh, and it's an area where my desires don't... Uh, are not all in the same basket and it's it's not easy and some people struggle with other things um, you shouldn't assume because you know somebody and like somebody that they didn't do something bad but you also shouldn't assume the other way so I, I just I want people to try not to judge even even if they like somebody a lot or or even if they know somebody who made a claim that they were assaulted comfort people um, but don't uh, don't reach a conclusion if you're not in a place to do so. Or if if you feel that you really have to make a conclusion, it's your wife, it's a sibling, it's somebody who really, really needs you on their side, then don't pretend to be fair or neutral or honest and tell people that you can't be. Uh, and I, I would accept that. Uh, I just, I would, I don't accept people who uh, who will jump to one side or the other without uh, without being in, in the right place to fairly and, and really in a way that shows that they care about fairness, fairly evaluating these things. Um, I appreciate Joe Walsh's withdrawal from the presidential race. I don't feel that he was obliged to withdraw. Joe, Joe Walsh uh, is a Republican who ran, or I think he was talking about running on the libertarian ticket. Uh, uh, for the presidency of the United States. And I guess I primarily appreciate his withdrawal because I, I think it'll lead to good results. But I, I think that he never should be seen to be potentially obligated to withdraw. And I would never blame him for not doing so. A democracy really should always be in a state where people should feel comfortable to run for office without worrying about how it might upset the power balance or, or how it might upset a delicate race. Uh, as a potential candidate, that is your, uh, your potential role to take. In the same way that I don't blame people for deciding to on a voting strategy, even if it leads them to vote in ways that I don't like. Um, and, and in general, I I can guarantee to people that I won't go after them for how they vote on almost any topic. There are perhaps t things that could be brought up, maybe in another country, that would uh, that would condone violence against people. Like if if we were talking about uh, it being legal to to kill gay people, and somebody voted for that kind of bill that might be one of the areas where I would blame somebody quite a lot for voting for such a thing. Fortunately, we're not there. And I think at least for now, such things are pretty far off the table. But if we ever fall that far, that might be a situation where I might blame somebody for voting a certain way. But in the general case, and in practice, even on issues I care a lot about, like uh, universal health care, I'm a big supporter of that. But I, I won't blame people who don't support it, who don't like it, and who reliably vote against it. Um, I will. Uh, I wouldn't uh, go after them. I wouldn't draw large conclusions about who they are as a person because of their vote, because people can come up with lots of different reasons for their stances, and the reasons, the how they think, is the important thing. Um, and we all just have to deal with the burden of living in a society that's decided. Hmm. It decides how it works this way. But as part of that, 
I pretty much exempt people from personal responsibility for their votes, uh, or at least for the results of their vote. I'll still be passionate about elections, and particularly the coming one. I'm starting to feel on Twitter that I'm, I'm getting a feeling that I was having partway through the my stay on Google Plus. I don't use Facebook. Maybe if I did, I would have gotten this feeling there. But at least partway through my time on Google Plus, I was starting to get a, a feel for the social fabric around me. I'd know somebody who knows somebody else. And I, I would often bump into people frequently, even if I didn't follow them. And, uh, and I'm I'm seeing that on Twitter a little bit. I'm I'm seeing the shape of who follows who among the the people who I've decided to make part of my intellectual life there. And it's nice. I still sometimes worry about eventually being banned on Twitter because there are some areas where they have policy where I'm not going to follow it if it ever comes up. Um, it largely has to do with free speech, and we'll be talking. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit more about that later on in the video. But, um, but there there are some areas where I could see myself doing some things that would get me suspended or banned from Twitter, and I I hope it doesn't happen. But I'm not going to change my behavior to prevent it from happening, even though I'm also not going to seek it out. been dis listening to a lot of Duke Ellington recently and uh, also a lot of uh, French jazz and chanson uh, music. I Some of this is, I there's a animated movie called uh, The Triplets of Belleville that I, I, I've liked for a while. And there's a musician who did a song for the movie um, who, who, who does like French pop jazz. Um, and I've been looking for more music like that. There's a, there's a song that that's actually just called the triplets of Belleville. That's a lot of fun. It has a great beat. It's uh, goofy lyrics. Um, it has a goofy music video as well, where there's a guy going to a psychotherapist and describing, uh, goofy imagined past vacations. And he ends up kind of going nuttier and nuttier as the song goes on. Uh, I just, it, it really stuck in my head, but I've been looking for more music that evokes that feeling. Um, you get a lot of like Romani music, Baltic music, stuff like that, that has a similar fun sound to it. And it's a little, it, it's a little hard to find these things on my own because like no people I know in real life are, are into this uh, kind of thing. But, uh, but I'm still finding some uh, some pretty good stuff, like a Parov Stellar. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. I've been thinking a little bit about counterfactuals and rally around the base effects, uh, because this came up in a conversation where. We were imagining different ways the Republican Party might have gone if Trump had not been the nominee. I think in general, whenever you have somebody who's seen as leading the party, then people who are part of uh, a party, they reshape their beliefs and passions uh, around that person's uh, personal magnetism. And that means that whoever is the president of the United States is effectively defining the party in a lot of ways during their presidency. It's not an official role, but if you want to see how the electorate of that party shifts, it shifts significantly toward, at least the mainstream does, towards that person's perspectives. And so I think that this is one of the things that I really worry about with Trump leading the Republicans and that I, I want their party to recover uh, because if they're sick, then the Democratic Party will also be sick and radicalized and, and so on. And I don't really want populism to take over both parties. And I, I think 
he's almost uniquely bad as a Republican candidate for the directions that he's taking uh, Republican passions. But it's interesting to imagine how things would have looked like if, say, Romney had gotten the nomination and the presidency uh, instead. I think it'd be a very different... Uh, we, the United States would look pretty different today. I think to a certain degree, I, I appreciate what Obama did to the Democratic Party. He didn't exactly tame all of the all of the left, but he acted as a fantastic role model for what responsible uh, liberal thought can look like. And I think we needed that. And we didn't have all the personal scandals of Clinton. Uh, we didn't have just all, all the mess that, that we otherwise might have had. And so I think he was good for the party and good for the left. And I worry when I see the right cur uh, currently having that rally around the, the base effect uh, with somebody like Trump. I've been also been thinking a little bit about being organized, which is probably one of the biggest shifts that I've had in my life from when I was younger. When I, when I was in second or third grade, I had a, a lot of difficulty being organized. It's probably the biggest challenge in my life. I had just gotten out of a year with an abusive teacher and some other uh, mildly messy things in my uh, in my life that uh, and some things in my head got kind of screwed up. And maybe it was also just significantly being that young, you, you have a tough time paying attention, but I had a lot more difficulty than many people did. And so uh, I, I was assigned, uh, like there were two super organized people in, in the uh, challenge program, which is a, a, a program for gifted kids that I was in. Um, there were two particularly organized people that I, uh, because I think the, the principal, when he was talking with my parents about this, he suggested I should find some people in my class who would help me be organized. I named two people who looked super organized. And they helped nag me into somewhat better organization, but I still struggled with it throughout much, much of my early life. And I think it was maybe in my mid-20s that I finally realized a how much it was hurting me not to be organized about much of anything but b that it could be intellectually interesting to be organized uh, to be at least moderately organized and that I could bring some of the the skills and interests that I had as a programmer into it so I started keeping spreadsheets of various things and keeping logs of various things and I think by by somehow siphoning some of the passion that I have for programming into being organized, I've dramatically reshaped myself from who I was back then. And now it's one of those things where I often act as a, a diplomat for being organized. I, I talk to people about the financial spreadsheets that I keep and, and the other other things like using uh, using Google Calendar almost religiously uh, to, to keep track of like, when did I talk to the landlord? When did I start having this health problem? I make separate calendars for all these things and I can, uh, I have easy access to data provided that I take the time, let's provide that I develop the habits of entering that data into somewhere that's queryable to begin with. And that's, it served me well. And it's one of those things where I wish that I had had the necessary realizations uh, to have started that earlier. But I, hindsight, again, is one of those things that you develop as you get older. And maybe it's good that I've had the time. Maybe it's good to have had the experience of noticing flaws in my life and in myself 
and successfully ha taken steps all on my own without somebody pushing me into it to correct those flaws. I think with the pandemic, um, I know it sounds like I'm jumping around topic to topic. I am. I. It's just over the last. Oh, oh, since I've done one of these, I, I I built a big list of things that I want to talk about and added some notes. I'm kind of going down the line here, just so that I'm not going up and spitballing the whole uh, the whole way uh, the whole time that I'm talking, and then afterwards it's like, oh, I should have talked about that. Um, maybe being that or being organized, it's that kind of thing uh, again. But um, I think I the. When I was a libertarian some years back, there were a, like there were principles around which my mental life was organized, or at least in, in terms of social obligations and philosophy. But there were also a few quotes that I, I like to bandy around in arguments, just like anybody. And one of them I think is a Franklin quote. Um, those who give up essential liberty to it, to achieve a, a little temporary safety d deserve neither li uh, liberty nor safety. Um, and I've been thinking about this in terms of the pandemic, uh, because in, in general, like th these are, it's interesting to see how different political philosophies react to situations. And I think that that this. This quote does not hold up very well under a pandemic because here, this is a case where giving up um, liberty that we, we ordinarily would consider quite essential for a little bit of temporary safety, uh, it does us a lot of good by, by accepting that we're locked in, that we're uh, either locked in or significantly restricted by giving up on interacting with people in person to a large extent, uh, we are achieving some uh, some safety, uh, temporary safety, I, I suppose. Um, and I, I think it's still a very worthy thing. And I think it makes possible a lot of things later. Um, and so I think it, it illustrates some of the faults in the style of thinking that, that's embedded in the quote. Now, we might take issue with whether it's essential liberty or whether it's only temporary safety. Um, I think probably questioning whether it's temporary safety is the better line of argument if you really wanted to try and disagree with me on this. Um, but I, I think it's, but maybe the way we should think about it is we're invited to think more deeply about what what the quote means what is the what are the insights embedded in that quote and i think what it is is that uh, it suggests that when we lose a liberty we lose the habit of seeing it as essential and we establish a precedent that rarely lifts later of it not being an essential liberty that we should try really hard to uphold and i think this is true uh people who aren't who aren't raised with a certain liberty uh certain liberty or a conception of li liberty or even a level of liberty they rarely see it as as that important um because liberties are culture they're they're not part of natural law or or anything like that they're they're cultural beliefs that we hold in society so in many circumstances, people who don't want to live on a continually eroding island of of liberties, they should be wary of giving anything up because if they give up, uh, if they give it up, you have a precedent of it being given up. And there's always the well, this looks like another time that we should give it up. Whereas if you're if you've never given it up before, then uh, then you have a, a better uh, at least from some perspectives, you have a better ability to hold on to it in the future. Now, how does this apply in a pandemic? I understand that if, if you really believe in a certain political value, let's maybe shift a little bit away from the liberty perspective, because it's not just liberties. It's it's also beliefs and social programs that, that could be eroded in this, like 
Are we going to lose public transit significantly? And a lot of people are worried about that right now in New York City. So if you don't want to, to lose that norm, then you should be vigilant uh, on, in protecting it and very wary of giving it up even temporarily uh, because it might not come back afterwards uh, as soon as the reason for its departure ends. And so it, it makes sense to guard these things, but also in a pandemic, many things will naturally end with no pressure, probably at least. And so you'd want to get a feel for what are the things that you actually have to shout about, um, even if you give them up for now, to make sure that they're not gone for good and to make sure that you've not eroded the grounds you have for protecting it next time or erode the centrality of it in culture. Just a little bit more to go. Um, I wanted to note that to a lot of people on first glance who don't subscribe to it, hard paternalism looks a lot like hostility. I think this is one of the big differences that uh, in my political philosophy at this point from when I was much younger. I believe in hard paternalism. I believe that when people are in certain states in their lives, particularly if they're homeless, uh, sometimes if they have issues with drugs that prevent them from functioning even minimally, that it is a, a appropriate for the state to step in, act as a parent, and uh, I mean act as if it were a parent, and attempt to fix the situation. Uh, but to, to a lot of people, if they see social workers come and scoop a homeless person off the street and put them in one of these programs that's designed to rehabilitate them, they'll see hostility because they don't see the, um, the hard edges of, of policy that can be necessary to achieve good results. Uh, they, they see the, the hardness of that and, and they, they have associations because it's not part of their philosophy of that verse, uh, and just brutalizing someone. And I, I don't think that it's the case and I think that it's important for us to have a tolerance of paternalism uh, because otherwise we're giving up on too many good things we're giving up on too many good results now there are legitimate and important discussions to have uh, about when it's to be applied and if somebody is just um, a bit tubby or a bit too grumpy or so on you don't always want to intervene with this. You ideally want to have broad paths of the way that people can be in society and be reluctant to interfere. But, uh, and so figuring out the borders for when paternalistic policies should apply and maybe even how they should be scaled in gradually, that, that makes sense. But giving up on paternalism as a whole, I think is a mistake. Uh, and if we accept this, then we have to develop a tolerance of some of the hard edges that come with paternalism. And, but that, that kind of tolerance is a major cultural dividing line. Those of us who accept it, we see it and we're like, well, I'd like to know more to make sure that the right thing is happening here versus somebody who doesn't accept paternalism in any significant degree. They see it and they think, oh my goodness, it's horrible. Somebody is being, um, being carted away. And we, I think in theory, we, we all have some acceptance of hard edges. Like if, if somebody goes into a bar and starts swinging at people and the police come and, and drag them away, you might see the police removal of them. And yeah, you're, you're going to be disturbed by, by that kind of action. Um, but, uh, but we have, uh, but I, I think a lot of this is context. It's pretty clear to see if you saw the person there uh, swinging at, uh, at all sorts of, of people, um, you're already put into that panic, uh, panicky mode that we see when we see visceral, horrible things, but you know why you did, and you're going to blame that person to a certain extent, even if it's not fair to blame, even if there was some other reason. 
but you'll attribute it to that person's actions. And it's a, it's a little bit less emotionally obvious when to do it for situations where it's, just, it's an ongoing tragedy, like somebody living on the street uh, um, and uh, like in a big a pile of clothes on, on the side of the sidewalk uh, or, or like asking everybody passing by, uh, do you have some crack or making vaguely threatening statements? so on you're not necessarily going to when the social worker comes to scoop them up and bring them to a shelter and to start to try and re rehabilitate them you might not you're not primed by by seeing something deeply visceral and they're being carted away and so you're gonna see it maybe in my view you'll misparse the situation as being hostile uh, even though it's, uh, in my view, the right thing to do to scoop them up and do that. But I understand the, the difficulty in parsing that people feel, why they get that kind of visceral uh, disapproval uh, of seeing that. And I guess finally, the, 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 thing, the last thing I want to, to talk about, and this is a, a, a bigger topic, And it's a recent one. It's Twitter and Trump. For a long time, Twitter initially was a pretty good platform for free speech. Its founder talked about Twitter as being a haven for free speech. Um, but over time, They've stopped being particularly good about that. They've started banning people for more than threats. Uh, they've started banning people for what they see as hateful speech. And e even if the speech, it's not threatening anything. Uh, it's just not recognizing things that they're seeing as social. Maybe rights is not the right term, but obligations. And I found this disturbing for a while. And uh, I've wished that they would stop this. I, and I, I have pushed for an adoption of values whereby we would, uh, hopefully a, a lot of us would criticize Twitter for this kind of blocking or banning people for saying things that aren't threatening, uh, even if they're disrespectful. Um, but I, I, they've not been on my good list for free speech for a while. More recently, Trump, uh, Trump has been a irresponsible speaker for a long time. Uh, he's pushed dangerous ideas. Uh, he's had little regard for truth. Um, he, if you're looking for a bad speaker, it's hard to find a better example of, of a malignant uh, speaker than him. It's particularly dangerous because it's president. A lot of people um, look uh, to their uh, to the president as a role model. All that said, the, the recent Twitter actions against Trump are not things that have bothered me much because they're not banning his speech. They're not blocking him or muting him. Uh, they're, they're giving him the courtesy that I think should be afforded us all. What they have been doing, which provoked the recent conflict between Trump and, and Twitter, is that they've started annotating his speech. That is, for dangerous statements, or blatantly false and scurrilous lies, they've marked them as being inaccurate or uh, as otherwise being problematic. And I don't mind that. I, I don't see that as being a dangerous type of censorship. And I don't mind when a platform does that. I do mind, to a limited extent, the way that they've done it by hiding it behind a, a, a click-through I would rather them just add some text 
around the tweet that that marks their that where they can have a little blurb indicating what their problem is with certain types of speech and that's fine and uh if they were if they were to offer that to everybody and stop banning people uh or suspending people for saying things that are offensive uh or disrespectful or, or whatever i think uh, a lot of my issues with twitter would disappear just apply that as a blanket standard you can annotate my my speech i don't mind uh, i would feel a lot more secure on your uh, on your platform if if i know that you're not going to suspend me or or ban me and i i, I would like to see this broadly ap applied i don't uh you don't want google to cancel your account because uh somebody took issue with something that you said on youtube particularly because I worry about the political environment in a lot of these tech companies where you end up having uh, the people that I call progressives, the cultural warriors who are not really into free speech and are keen on censoring disrespectful speech against groups that they really care about. Um, if they worm their way into HR or otherwise can make enough noise, they can capture a workplace to it to a certain extent and make it really uncomfortable to speak there. I worked in a big tech company and the, some of them were trying to get jokes banned because they felt that people who don't speak English as a first language were left out by a lot of jokes and they'd never understand it. And they don't want to have that kind of difference in cultural participation that happens. And I thought that was nuts. There was a lot of nutty things that I saw there. Uh, that I didn't approve of, and I it just I know that those people can capture or at least significantly sway a workplace towards adopting some of their weird uh, ideas, and I worry that as is internal would become external that they uh, that they can sway the way that platforms decide what speech to accept, and I would rather us have a strong cultural norm where you can annotate speech as a platform, but uh, but in general, unless somebody is calling for violence or organizing violence uh, or, uh, or certain other things that skirt close to being illegal, I want there to be a norm that platform providers do not censor speech or hide speech by making it uh, difficult to find through search engines or removing it from recommendation engines, although tuning it to the audience is, is fine, but just, uh, but that ideally shouldn't uh, shouldn't make it blanket harder to find. Um, so Twitter, I don't think did quite the right thing. I, I think at least for one of Trump's tweets, they hit it behind a click through where you had to click saying, yes, I want to see content of this sort. But I think Trump was, uh, I mean, he was petty in his response and that he was using a, a personal interaction as a way to say, oh, let's change the law to turn the tables on somebody because of my personal one-on-one -on -one interaction with, with them, with this platform. I think that that's not the way that government should be run. If he was worried about this issue, he should have dealt with it not because of his personal involvement, but uh, but rather because he saw it as an ongoing issue. And beyond that, his way of dealing with it, I don't think it's going to survive legal challenge. And even if it did, I think it would be an unhealthy way for platforms to be uh, pushed to, to behave. And that he didn't find ways that genuinely protect free speech, uh, it, it's, it's drafted wrong. It's, uh, it doesn't achieve valuable social ends and it risks destroying platforms that act as, uh, as, um, as modern public forums. And that, that's pretty undesirable. So there's, there's a lot that I, I see in terms of problems for, uh, for how this worked out, even though I don't see Twitter as being a particularly good actor either. Um, and I guess this, this deletion issue came up recently and that I, 
I get in arg arguments with people from all over the political map because so long as it's interesting, uh, I'll generally keep arguing with somebody even if I really don't like what they're arguing for. And so I had a discussion with a white nationalist, um, a fairly long one, maybe two or three days ago on Twitter. And I... I I think just I'm I'm still a little weirded out by but it was an informative discussion because it wasn't we didn't it was reasonably polite dis despite how strongly we disagreed with each other and I guess I I'm still trying to wrap my head around the perspective that this person was coming from uh because they but I've gotten some insights. Uh, it's just they they see they were arguing that uh, that other parts of the of the world act as ethnic homelands, and that white people should have ethnic homelands. And to me, that's not something that I want. I mean, uh, maybe it's I come from a family that's multi ethnic. Uh, like I have black cousins. Uh, otherwise, my family has a, a lot of people of European and Jewish and other descent in it. It's just kind of a big crab bag. And so to, to me, like, I, I don't, I'm not sure if I would feel really at home in a, in any kind of uh, homeland of that sort for white people or for, for other people. I, I'm not friendly to the idea of ethnic homelands. And I, this came up a little bit in, in a re recent Intelligence Squared debate on Israel and uh, because I, I don't approve of Israel's trying to be an ethnic, uh, ethnic homeland for a Jewish people either. Um, it, but just in general, I, I don't... Uh, I, w I was trying to understand what the appeal is. Why, what is it that they feel that they're missing and not having one of these homelands? Or how would it work? What, what, are, what are the concrete deliverables that they're looking for here we didn't exactly get to that in the, in the discussion it just there, there was a uh, he gave an impression that he didn't feel safe with the shifting demographics in the united states he was worried about minorities rising up and oppressing white people and so on and uh i guess this, it, these aren't things that i worry about and in general i just i don't even think much in terms of race uh, again, coming from a family with a lot of different ethnicities and working closely with people who probably like uh, as a whole, um, most of the workplaces I've been in, they've been very mixed, uh, and like both genders and all the like as many races as you can imagine. Uh, but we didn't see ourselves that way. We didn't see ourselves as carrying around flags or ethnicities, or at least I didn't. Um, but I think the the impression, apart from, like, he seemed to be a very afraid person. Uh, he he was, he really seemed to have, like, doom on the horizon. And wanted some way to, to be safe from that. But the, the other impression that I got, and I guess I'm trying to piece it together with other grumbles that I've heard from people who seem to have philosophies similarly to this, it comes down to, or at least this is my theory, I think it probably comes down to cosmopolitanism, which is part of my political ideology, or you can call it globalism if you like. But I believe in ideals for society where we don't see the boundaries between culture as fixed, where we borrow ideas from other culture and we're generally pretty open to adopting them or changing them along the way. We're not trying to preserve any kind of purity or anything of that sort. And we, we eventually hope to forget a lot of these boundaries as time goes on. And we don't really believe in in the mechanisms or the goals of traditional societies. And I, I think what I've seen when, I, when I've seen other people argue against uh, globalism or cosmopolitanism 
is a frustration with a lot of the the rules that we tend to build into society when our ideas win and these are these are things like um like not having christmas displays uh on uh, uh in in the center of towns because to, to me that's that's an official endorsement of of religion uh and it's not something that i really think the state should do uh, and so I, I like to have this kind of strong notions of separation of state and this notion that like society is not trying to be about uh, about the, the heritage of a certain kind of uh, people. It's not trying to be about their religion. It's not trying to portray them and not other people. But I, I, the, I've occasionally heard people complain about this who I think are probably the same people who find it really frustrating that they couldn't go and and find a town with other people who feel the way that they do like set up a town in the united states where it really is where they can have their celebrations of their ethnic heritage as official things of their religious heritage as as uh, as official things i think they might be looking for what was some of the original american colonial experience where you would had like puritans come over and yes, they were oppressed, but they, they also really wanted to set up their own shop where they set up a town, they write the rules, and it's all about them. And people like me, cosmopolitans, uh, globalists, we tend to set up rules that make it very hard for them to do that. And I think they're probably pretty frustrated at, uh, at that. And that might be the kind of thing that they're resenting. Um, seeing and they, they they might have this notion of the good old days as well and some other less savory things but I, I can if I stretch my head around it I can kind of understand where they're going at although I think I'm still pretty much a guaranteed enemy of that it literally is bad uh, it, it's it's an anti-goal of mine to have that kind of thing and so, like, no, somebody like me is not going to sit by and let them set up. Uh, I mean, by by not let, I'm I'm not talking about having the military come in and break up their the way that they do things. But some someone like me is not going to approve of it. In uh, in social groups, like like if they set up, maybe a Rotary club that. Is, is trying to be monoethnic and, and so on. I'm not going to really speak highly of that. I'm probably going to be pretty disturbed by its existence, even if it's not banned. But if they're trying to pull it into the public sphere, even if they have a town that's like 80 or 90% them, somebody like me is maybe gonna come in and say, look, you can't use the public square for this. Uh, because we in the United States are not, uh, we, we don't let the state act as, as a closely enmeshed form of culture like that. And, and, but, but I, I guess that, that's probably what they, that I'm guessing that it, uh, if I had had, if the conversation had continued further that, uh, and if I had gotten the chance to talk with them about what exactly this uh, by them I just mean this particular person I'd ask them what exactly do you want this is probably an aspect to it and this is probably a frustration they have just because just based on my impression that it's the same people same kind of perspective as the other people that I've met earlier in my life who wanted this thing and also seeing how other cultural enclaves work uh, like the Amish and so on, where they really have set up their own society and uh, and they just want to be left alone and they're not keen to integrate into the the bigger cosmopolitan society that people like me are are advocates of. And I, I, I think that these perspectives are reasonably fringe, but I also think that we've done a pretty good job at nudging people away from them, uh, mainstream people away from them. And I've, I'm not in I don't feel entirely safe that most people find them reprehensible in the way that I do. It's just they haven't thought about them and they'd find them weird. Uh, 
because I, I think oftentimes social movements in society, uh, not social movements, not a uh, wrong word, societies get moved by the people who care the most. Uh, and that can be a bunch of individuals who don't uh, who don't talk to each other that's that much. That's why I'd, I'm wary of the term social movements because there's not uh, it's not like there's a globalist meeting that I'd go to. I, I don't think I've even ever really talked about it much with other people about uh, my cosmopolitan ideals. Or and certainly we there's not a cosmopolitan club that I know of. If there were, maybe I'd join it and it'd be interesting to talk. But it's um, but not, but I think just the collective effort of maybe two or five percent of people who have these ideas can drive all of society towards them if nobody else cares. And that I think, but if nobody else cares, then you also don't have a, a strong resistance against somebody on the other side who really cares and really doesn't like my perspectives, uh, our perspectives. If they if they're really good at uh, or I mean if they're really devoted to pulling a, a different uh, in a different direction then our, uh, our the, what we've built is fragile and so that makes me a little nervous but I, I think that's also the case in general for for technocracy and that I, I don't think most people in the general sense they have a strong belief in experts and they they, they don't necessarily love experts and so but it's just they've never really thought about alternatives. And so you, you end up having the experts able to drive because most people aren't getting in their, their way most of the time. The issue is that populists, if they just have a blanket distrust of experts, then they can effectively counter a lot of good policy just by virtue of the, of the, the winds of good policy are fragile because they never really were that all that publicly supported or opposed to begin with. Now, unfortunately, I, I like going. I like going back over past discussions and thinking about different angles of what was argued. But the person I was arguing with, they ended up being um, being uh, either suspended or or banned from Twitter not too long after the conversation ended. And I find that frustrating because it just means all I can see is my half of the conversation. Nobody else can see uh, anything but my half. I didn't report them. I don't, uh, they didn't, they weren't in my view threatening. I wouldn't have reported them. I still find their views something that I, I strongly oppose, but I wish that there, that the discussion were still there because these are discussions where I, I don't think we lose by having them out there invisible. Uh, I, if anything, I would like to have my discussion visible to everybody so that, um, so that it, it can be referenced so that people know this is what the shape of cosmopolitan slash globalist ideas looks like on my part. This is what white nationalist ideas look like on their part. And this is how the arguments play out. And I, I hope that my arguments were better than theirs. I, I hope that maybe if if we can raise uh maybe the solution to most people being neutral on these topics or never having thought about them is to have these discussions out there in public because i i at least hope that in the end my arguments will echo louder and that will be and that society would be better off being explicitly uh cosmopolitan rather than uh, just being accidentally cosmopolitan because nobody showed up to argue the other side because people are showing up to argue the other side. The, the populists are at least making a lot of noise right now. And uh, those of us who are in the cosmopolitan uh, pro education, uh, pro higher education camp, we're not in the habit of ever having argued our side. And that's not a good thing. Um, I think we, we need to do better uh, on our side, showing people why, uh, why, population, uh, why populism is, it leads to bad results, why it's unhealthy, uh, why it, it's bad for democracy, and so on. And, uh, and so I, I, I would like my, my discussion to 
uh, with him to be part of that, uh, uh, to, for it to be an exhibit for that. But unfortunately, Twitter, somebody must have reported him, and uh, I'm, I'm assuming it's a him, actually. I don't know whether it's a guy or gal, but somebody must have reported him, and it's no longer up there. Um, so both for purposes of my perusal and for having it be an exhibit, it's it can't serve that valuable purpose. So I'm, I'm a little frustrated by that, and it does play into Twitter being uh, too willing to censor. And so I think what I would really like between if if we if we divide the five ways that Twitter uh, can uh, can handle free speech issues, uh, like on one hand, uh, you you block or ban accounts that uh, that you don't like, uh, and and that's that's really extreme. It's not something that I uh, I like. And way on the other hand, you just permit everything that's not uh, that's not doxing and it's not uh, threats of violence or organizing violence or, or something like that. Uh, and maybe uh, maybe you're okay with glorifying violence, maybe you're not, but you, you still have like very clear things that are relatively apolitical. Uh, um, you have apolitical rules that, that are rarely breached where you might be willing to ban, but otherwise you don't because you believe in free speech as a social norm. Then you have all this stuff in the middle. You you have, uh, let's let's just annotate text on uh, uh which is close to free speech. You, you say, you can say what you want, but we may add some additional text around your speech to add context or to say, this doesn't fit the facts and it's dangerous or so on. I'm cool with that. You can have click-throughs, which, uh, which we're going to hide this by default and you have to click to see it. Uh, and I'm not really comfortable with that. And I, I wish that they wouldn't do that. And then you have the uh, we're also going to make your speech very hard to find by not having it show up in searches, in recommendation engines, and follows, and stuff like that. Uh, like the, the soft mute uh, approach. I'm really, really not comfortable with that. Uh, just basically, I, uh, the, the, the two things that I'm comfortable with, and I wish Twitter would commit, and I wish all platforms would commit to, uh, to either accept everything with very, very narrow apolitical exceptions or ex uh, accept everything but have the ability to add some surrounding text to content where the platform pro uh, provider wants to chime in. I think those two, those two are acceptable. Anything further than that is not. That's, that's where I really would like to see Twitter land on this. And same thing with YouTube. Uh, I don't think YouTube, uh, there is an additional complication with YouTube because some people are trying to make money off of it. But I think the way Google should manage it is rather than deciding that some content is not monetizable, they should just tailor the ads that they sell to being compatible with the perspectives that they're, uh, that fit the um, fit the content. So if you're worried that oh this is going to offend uh, Muslims, then don't air it in Muslim majority countries. Tailor your ads uh, that way, but air everything and let everything be monetized. And try really hard not to have perspectives lead to different economic outcomes. Um, so that'd be a, the wrinkle that I'd add for YouTube. But th those are those are the norms that I would like to push for all social media platforms. I think just Trump is is wrong though for pushing for uh, only for literal publish everything, uh, and I think he also has some confusion about what's actually happening uh, in terms of how Twitter acts. But I do think Twitter also acts uh, unacceptably on these topics. As to whether the law is the right mechanism to do these things, I think a, a properly drafted law, and, and I don't think an executive order can do this, I think a properly drafted law could do the right thing here. And I would support so something if it were very carefully drafted to 
to per, uh, to uh, to only permit censorship of again things like doxing or uh, or threats of violence or organization of violence things like that um, that can be banned allow platforms to uh, to, uh, to annotate but don't allow them to do click throughs I think th those are those are things where I, I, I think we, we could see the right thing happen but we're definitely not seeing the right thing happen from Trump here and it's it's also just law should not come through petty routes like this anyhow that's that's what I've I had to talk about um, this this has been much longer than previous ones because I think with the whole uh, coronavirus thing, a lot of the habits that I was trying to build were thrown off. Um, but also just, uh, it's hard to build a new habit. And uh, it's also hard to break uh, old habits. Um, anyhow, if you have any questions on this, you can tweet at me or leave a comment and hopefully I'll notice the comment. Um, I'm probably not that hard to track down in terms of sending me an email if you'd like to do that instead. Uh, if you have topics that you'd like to see covered or you'd like to hear my thoughts on any particular things, uh, I am uh, happy to get that feedback. I wouldn't promise to do anything in particular, but, uh, but I, I would take it under advisement. Anyhow, uh, be well, and at some point you will probably get another one of these.